Paisab talked about him. Uh, he was not only a political leader, he was an Islamic scholar as well. He dedicated his life on Dawa. He wrote numerous books, and he was one of the most popular political figures in the country. He was elected as member of parliament many times. He was a successful minister that was running the government in the immediate past. And his execution, that's why, summarizes what is happening in Bangladesh. Today I will be not talking too much about my father specifically, but whatever I will be talking encompasses what happened and why it happened to my father. So it is actually very, very much related. The son of democracy, human rights, as well as freedom in Bangladesh has set on the 20th October of 2006. So it will be almost close to 10 years in marking. The people lost their right to vote. People lost their right to speak their mind. And our beloved religion, Islam, is under attack now. And it all started on the 20th October of 2006. And that was the last day of an elected government in Bangladesh. After that, in January 2000, uh, well, the first election took place in December 2008, and then another election took place in January 2013. But all those elections were not accepted by anybody in the international arena. I will take you down to the memory lane a little bit so that you get uh, an overview of what actually uh, happened throughout in Bangladesh uh, so that you get a complete picture, but uh, we are uh, having time constraints. I will not be spending too much time. I will be very brief, very specific. As you all know, when the British left the Indian subcontinent, which encompasses Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan in 1947, we had two geographic countries. One was India and one was Pakistan. And Pakistan was uh, a land that was supposed to be the land, the word Pakistan actually stands for Holy Land, that was supposed to be uh, the Holy Land for entire Muslim Ummah. Unfortunately, when the Pakistan was formed in 1947, it was marred by military regime, and when military regime runs a country, everything goes wrong. So Pakistan could not live up to the expectation and at the same time, if you look into that time, Pakistan was the largest Muslim country of the world. A lot of people around the world was looking up to Pakistan at that time, and Bangladesh was East Pakistan at that time. If you read the books written by retired Indian intelligence people, there is a very famous book that's called uh, Cowboys of India, spelled with K-A-O. General Cow was the founder of Indian intelligence organization called RAW, Research and Analysis Wing. It was formed in 1965. And if you read that book, from the very inception, the job of RAW was to break up Pakistan. That was their modus operandi, that was their ultimate objective. So they started working since 1965, and they became successful in 1971. I'm not saying that there was no discrimination that took place. As I say, when military runs the country, everybody is discriminated against. So in 1971, 16th December was a very sad day for Muslim Ummah, because the largest Muslim country was divided. A new country was created, and that was Bangladesh where I was born in 1977, six years later. Whatever the emotion is, that breakup of Pakistan was contrary to 
what Brother Yahya recited at the very beginning, or at the same movie, Hablillahi Jamil, Falat Farah. And that was the reason most Muslim political and religious leaders at that time wanted to unite Pakistan at that time, no matter what. And my father, being the Najim Ala, president of Jamiat al Talaba, which is the largest student organization of the world, at that time, he played his political role at that time, trying to prevent the conflict between the Bangladeshi people and Pakistani army. But if you read that in broad landscape, it was actually the agenda of RAW. And the reason at that time, all the Muslim and Islamic political and religious people did not want East Pakistan to separate from West Pakistan was, first of all, you were breaking up the largest Muslim country of the world. Second of all, if you look at the geography of Bangladesh right now, former East Pakistan, from three sides, it is surrounded by a very hostile country called India. And on the other side, on the southern side, we have Bay of Bengal. We have a very small little border with Myanmar, but that's negligible. You will not find a second country in the world, except probably Palestine, that has this kind of geography. That means whatever discrimination, suppression you were talking about from the Western side, if you are separated, you will be even more endangering yourself because India from the very get-go, historically, was never cordial with Muslims. They're very hostile against Muslims historically. That was the reason. If you are a little bit uncomfortable with uh, our West Pakistani brothers, you would be 100,000 times more discomfortable in the newly formed country, and that's exactly what's happening. Bangladesh is independent only by name. Bangladesh is a country that is virtually run from Delhi. The general mass never got a chance to properly be educated about Islam, but from the heart, majority of the Muslim people loves Islam. That's why the process was very, very clinical. This group never wanted Bangladesh to be absolutely secular or socialist or communist. Rather, the proclamation of independence were equality, justice, and dignity. And all three things are gone right now in Bangladesh. Right after the independence, the government led by Sheikh Mujibur Rahman started to slowly remove all the signs of Islamic culture from the arena. The four pillars of constitution became socialism, democracy, uh, secularism. From the symbol of Dhaka University, you had Iqra Bismillah al that has been removed. So slowly, the Islamization process started. And finally, in 1975, the democracy was also taken off. Bangladesh became one party country. BAKI Bakshal was formed, which is known as Bangladesh Krishok Sumik League. That was the only political party that was allowed. Everything else was banned. All the newspaper except for one was banned in 1975. And the result is obvious. From a group of army, as well as from a group of his own party, there was uh, a coup and Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, along with every single member of his family, was killed. The only two survivors were two sisters, and one of them is the current Prime Minister of Bangladesh. Now, after that era, people got a little bit of breathing room. General Ziaur Rahman came to power. Uh, he formed uh, a political party called Bangladesh Nationalist Party, which ran the country until 1981, and slowly the space for democracy was opening up. During the era of Sheikh Mujibur Rahman until 1975, all the Muslim political, Islamic political party was banned. 
Ziaur Rahman respected the spirit of Muslims in the country and added Bismillah Rahman Rahim as part of the constitution. Added in Allah we trust as part of the constitution. Although Islamic education never still flourished, but that made way for Islamic work to start. Jamaat Islami, the flag barrier political party of Islam in Bangladesh started to creep its way. In 1979, there was an election. You cannot call it free and fair election. It was still a military controlled election, but still there was breathing room. And General Zia Rahman was getting popularity every day. Unfortunately, he was martyred in 1981 and another dictator took over the country in 1981. There was a long struggle for democracy for nine years and along with everybody else, the Islamic political parties were very vocal, particularly Jamaat Islami on the street. In 1991, for the first time, Bangladesh saw the food or smelled the food of democracy for the first time and probably you can say the only time uh, there were a few other occasions Bangladesh saw the free and fair election. And that election was done under a prescription by Jamaat Islami, which was a very unique formula at that time. The concept was a caretaker government formula, which says that the immediately passed chief justice will lead the interim government, and that government will run the election. And the job of the government is just to run the election, that's it. After that, they will leave the power. So that concept was developed by the, the then Amir Jamaat Islami, Professor Ghulam Azam, and it was accepted. And right now, we are seeing many countries accepting that caretaker formula because nobody trusts the incumbent government to have a free and fair election. And latest example is Brazil. Brazil right now has an interim government. So this concept is becoming a, a phenomenon and it's a, it's a new thing in the arena of political science. So in 1991, for the first time, election took place. Uh, in 1996, another election took place and the, uh, the Awami League came to power. And in 2001, another election took place and PNP with the coalition of Jamaat Islami came to power. So these were the three terms where people saw that incumbent government failed in the national election and new government came to power. In 2001, in that election, Jamaat Islami shared the power with BNP and my father became minister for the first time in the country. And he was in charge of industries minister, ministry at first, he was in charge of agriculture ministry and then uh, later on he became <laughs> Uh, in charge of industries ministry. Now, in these 15 years, even with limited uh, scope, democracy was flourishing, and that gave tremendous opportunity for da'wah of Islam. If you look, if you take a sample before 1991 and after 1991, you will see there is a tremendous difference in the level of education about Quran, about Islamic concept in the country, and that was possible because, brothers and sisters, democracy works. Because if we can go to people and teach people about the true nature of Islam, that is when all the misconceptions about Islam will be taken away. Other than that, there is no shortcut, there is no other way. Now, when Jamaat Islami shared the power with BNP, although with very limited capacity at that time, Jamaat had only 20 members of parliament out of 300 seats, but because for the first time in 30 year history, Jamaat Islami got almost a uh, get out of jail card to preach about Islam to the general mass. And the popularity of Jamaat was rising. Now, if you remember, I say that still Bangladesh 
is a satellite country that's run by India. And during these 15 years, because democracy works, India couldn't exact its, exert its will on Bangladesh. And they did their math. And they found out that if this democratic trends continues, then probably it's a matter of time Jamaat Islam will be able to win the masses with the, with the heart of the masses. And the only way to stop it is to discontinue the process of democracy. On the 28th of October 2006, that was the last day of office for the elected government led by BNP and Jamaat. And on that day, Jamaat Islami was running a huge uh, public rally in the capital, in the heart of capital. More than 50,000 people were in attendance. And that was a brutal day in the history of Bangladesh. While my father was speaking, there was a vicious attack on the people, led by the thugs of Awami League. They came with goat paddle sticks, firearms, and bombs. And unfortunately, police was absolutely inactive. And they came very close to the stage while my father was speaking. And that also gives you an idea about his true nature, how patient and calm he can be. He knew that he could die in time, but he still chose not to provoke anybody. And he continued his speech saying that, inshallah, we will respond to this bullet with bellow, inshallah. Unfortunately, the people of Bangladesh did not get a chance to exercise their voting rights since that day. Six of our brothers were killed on that day. Hundreds and thousands were injured. And the worst part is those thugs were dancing on the dead body of our brothers who accepted Shahada on that day. Now, this created a panic among the international community. And that was actually planned. They took this violence as an excuse to bring in a civil government actually backed by military. The original formula of caretaker government was it was supposed to live by a former retired chief justice because at least they have some conscience. But that was the first time a bureaucrat who was working for World Bank for so long was appointed as the chief of the caretaker government, and it was actually backed by army. They ran the country for two long years and brought the current government into power in 2008, December 2008. Since that government came to power, they made their intention clear that they are out to destroy democracy, destroy civil liberty, destroy all sorts of space for speaking in public. And the first thing that they did is they crippled the army. There was a leaked research that was came out uh, of the Indian intelligentsia that in order to establish Indian influence in Bangladesh, you have three major problem roadblock. The first roadblock is army in Bangladesh is still very, very patriotic. Second roadblock is Jamaat Islami and its student organization. And third roadblock is the madrasa education that teaches people about Islam. So when Awamali government came to power with the blessing from India, they immediately killed 57 army officials starting from major general to second lieutenant. And that never happened in any civilized army in the world. In one day, 57 army official, officials were killed in the name of a border patrol mutiny. And that was a message. And most of those army officials were having Islamic belief. And that was a message saying that if army makes any move, they'll be gone. And immediately they started going after Jamaat Islam. And the first thing they did is they set up a tribunal to try the perpetrators of the war crimes in 1971 that took place between Bangladesh, Pakistan, and India. Now, as I said in my 
discussion that in 1971, during the war, the role of my father and Jamaat Islami was to keep Pakistan united. And the role was absolutely political. There was no criminal activity that was involved. However, that political role was perceived as criminal. And this tribunal was set up, initially the war bodies actually supported the tribunal because the slogan was catchy. They say that they want to end the culture of impunity and who doesn't support that, right? But the major and fundamental problem of the tribunal was that the tribunal suspended the fundamental rights of the citizen because it was meant to be trying army personnel. The second problem with the tribunal is that not only it suspends the fundamental and constitutional rights, it's, it also suspends the procedural law, which means the evidence law of the country does not apply. You do not need eyewitness for convicting anybody. Hearsay or written documents or books can be used uh, as evidence. That was a big question mark. Third problem was that the crimes were not defined. So anybody could be convicted of any crime. There was a very vague definition of crime against humanity, and it does not say what crime would constitute what punishment. So it was up to the judges who would be handing out, uh, handing out punishment on their discretion, and those judges were handpicked by the government who were actually asking for death sentence to the people they were trying. And the final problem of that tribunal was that there was no room for interlocutory appeal. That means if the judges say that you cannot bring this witness, that's it. You cannot go anywhere else in appeal against that. So this was, these were the specific four questions that were raised by United Nations, that was raised by Human Rights Watch, that was raised by Amnesty International. Name any legal expert in the world. They say this tribunal cannot deliver justice. And after what happened in the process of the tribunal, when international community were hearing about the fragrant violation of due process, their jaw almost dropped to the floor. There were incidents of witness being kidnapped from the dock of the court and nobody saying anything about that. There were incidents of witness being bribed and admitting that in public. There were incidents of ministers pretty much threatening the judge if they give a judgment other than that sentence, they will be in trouble. So all those things were out there. And they tried, so far they have executed four leaders of Jamaat, two leaders of Jamaat were, uh, died in prison, and there are still three more leaders of Jamaat who are awaiting their pardon. So that's one side of not giving rights to the people. Not only that, there is actually a zero tolerance on any dissent. If you want to come out in public and protest against this government, people will, police will not just shoot on your leg, they will shoot on your head. There is absolute zero tolerance on assembly. Any media that speaks against the government would be shut down. So far, two TV channels were taken off the air. Three TV channels in particular. They're even trying to regulate the Facebook and social medias because they cannot actually control that. There were a number of days social media was even not allowed. And they passed a new law. It's also unfortunately called ICT law, which is Internet Information and Communication Technology Law, where there is life sentence provision for anybody who will be defaming the government on social media. So there is no room for anything to do in the country. Despite that, people are still coming out on the street every day. My time is running out. I will just uh, conclude with two things. First thing I would like to say is that Every time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions trial and tests in the Holy Quran, 
the only way out of that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that patience, suffer. That is the only way out of this struggle. Throughout these last 10 years, I am really, really happy about the brothers and sisters that come. In some occasions, there were little blips. But other than that, four of the most respected and popular leaders of the country were executed. Not a fly was hard on the street. On the, on the May 11, my father was executed. He was supposed to be buried by the night. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had greater plans. They couldn't take the body to our village until the seven in the morning. And they set roadblocks so that people, could, people cannot attend the janazah. But people were coming in thousands. People were coming in thousands. The roadblock couldn't stop them. Their, their motor vehicle were stopped. People were walking miles and miles. My brother who was there to lead the janazah said that the first janazah took place, at, took place at seven in the morning and he couldn't see the end of the line. There were so many people and that was not the end. There were 26 janazah took place even after the burial and each of the janazah were bigger than the previous one. And there were countless janazah in absentia that took place across the world. I am getting response from people that I don't even know, from people of the world that I have no idea about existed. I have brothers calling me from Libya, brothers calling me from Papua New Guinea, sending me text message praying for my father's part and soul. This is a new and my father said that there is no way you can get the emotions get best of you. Democracy is always the solution, even if the process hurts you in the short run. In the long run, you will be victorious. In the ma'ala rusri yusra. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa